Now, most of you know something about Adam Smith. He's famous for The Invisible Hand, The Wealth of Nations. The Wealth of Nations might be his second best book. His other book is The Theory of Moral Sentiments. Now, a modern economist would say, I don't do moral sentiments. <laughs> if you ask, if somebody says to an economist, I don't think that's very fair. A lot of economists just, it's kryptonite. It's like, get that away from me. I don't do, I don't do fair. A lot of economists say, I don't do moral sentiments. And that title, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, is a little bit daunting to an economist. It seems outside the realm of economics. And what are moral sentiments anyway? Well, a better title for a modern reader might be The Theory of Morality and Sentiments. Smith was interested in why we sometimes avoid our self-interested selves and our sentiments and what determines our emotions. And in some editions, the book had a subtitle, an essay towards an analysis of the principles, you gotta be careful with those uh, long phrasings, by which men, and here comes the, the meat, by which men naturally judge concerning the conduct and character first of their neighbors and afterwards of themselves. So the heart of the book is a puzzle. Most people would accept the idea that we're self-interested, at least self-centered. Some people would say we're even, we're even selfish. Uh, and I think Adam Smith unfairly has a reputation as being a champion of selfishness, which I think, is, as we'll see, is a total misreading of Smith's vision of humanity. But the puzzle is this. <coughs> Given that we're self-interested, why do we ever do anything that's not self-interested? Why do we ever extend ourselves for others? Why do we ever sacrifice for others? And Smith raises this question in an example that he gives that is uh, often uh, quoted out of context. Let me give you the example. I'll show you where the context comes in. The, the story is a, the story of an earthquake. He says, imagine there's an earthquake in China that kills 100 million people. You'd feel terrible distress over that. You might make a donation to a charity. You might watch Turn On CNN to see what was going on in the modern example. He said, and then you'd go home and you'd sleep like a baby because they'd be out of your mind. He says, but if I told you that tomorrow you're going to have an operation, you're going to lose your little finger. You're going to toss and turn all night. And he says, how is it? And that's, 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 what, that's where most people end the quote. And they say, look at this, look at Smith. He, he, he actually believes that we care more about our little finger than 100 million Chinese. And the truth is, most of us emotionally react that way, which is, you can be excited, horrified, neutral about it. But it is, I think, true that we are much more sensitive to the misfortunes of ourselves, even when they're quite small, than, and they weigh on us in a way that misfortunes of others do not. Okay? As it gets closer to us, we might feel stronger and stronger about it. Right? An earthquake across town that kills 100,000 people, a car accident that kills a friend, God forbid, that we're going we're gonna to lose sleep over, we're going to be emotionally disturbed by. Deaths of strangers far away, even in the modern era, not so much. But Smith then raises what I think is the greatest question. He says, if that's true, if you care more about, if you emotionally care more about your little finger than 100 million Chinese, would you kill 100 million people to save your little finger? And the answer is absolutely not. But why, says Smith, why is it that your emotional reaction is so much stronger about your finger, but you won't act on it? And Smith then creates what is a, a wonderful metaphor, the idea that there's an impartial spectator watching us, that we imagine that someone who's not on our side, not against us, impartial, watching us and judging our character and our actions, and we don't want to have their disapproval. And in particular, we don't want the disapproval of our actual spectators, our friends and family. Interestingly, in 1759, this basis for your conscience doesn't come from God. It doesn't come from your parents. It comes from your own sense of being part of a society where people around you are looking at you and reacting to what you do and say. And he says, though it may be true, therefore, that every individual in his own breast naturally prefers himself to all mankind, which is so true, right? Yet he dares not look mankind in the face and avow that he acts according to this principle. He feels that in this preference, they, mankind, can never go along with him and that how natural soever it may be to him to prefer yourself to everyone else, it must always appear excessive and extravagant to them. So for us to put ourselves first all the time at the expense of others, we understand that people are not going to think that's very, a very good thing. I suggest that we can use this idea of the impartial spectator to create mindfulness, the ability to step outside ourselves and judge our own behavior. And that's a very powerful tool, I think, for being a better 
a spouse, a better friend, a better parent. Now, Smith argues that this pursuit of our own self-interest taken to uh, in certain directions, it's a natural part of us, obviously, that we limit because we're worried about the judgments of others. But this natural self-interest we do have sometimes gets put in directions that actually don't necessarily serve us. So often we will convince ourselves we're lovely when we're not. So although I have this impartial spectator who, who's over my shoulder trying to motivate me, I'm motivating myself through this worry that people are going to judge me unfavorably or looking for their applause that they will judge me favorably. At the same time, I can easily convince myself that the impartial spectator perched on my shoulder is my best friend and, of course, thinks the world of me. And so Smith says, he is a bold surgeon, they say, whose hand does not tremble when he performs an operation upon his own person, meaning it's really easy for us to judge other people and correct their flaws, do surgery on their problems. My own problems, eh, I'm not so eager to look at it. I'm not so eager to get into the, onto the operating table. And he is often equally bold who does not hesitate to pull off the mysterious veil of self-delusion, which covers from his view the deformities of his own conduct. So we not only don't want to fix ourselves, I don't even want to see what my problems are. I want to veil those, not just from the world, which of course I do. I don't want the world to know about my deformities, but I veil them from myself. So this is Smith's view of humanity. Man naturally desires to be loved and to be lovely with this caveat and footnote that we've got this little problem that we don't see ourselves often as we truly are. Now, Smith says if you want to be loved, there's an easy way to do it. Get rich, get powerful, get famous. And he says if you are those things, people will hang on your every word. He says unless you're like totally absurd, you walk into a room, people will admire you, they'll look at you, they'll want to know what you have to say about everything. And we've seen this phenomenon, pop stars opining on various things they know little about. People don't care. They want to hear what they have to say. Imagine Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt coming into the room. They've always been interested in Smith, so they're here for my talk. And they quietly pull up some chairs in the back and they start taking notes, you know, fascinated by Smith, of course. How long would it be before this lecture was horrifyingly disrupted, right? Everybody in the back would start looking. It's like when a, a really great fight breaks out at a football game, right? And then after a while, I'd be looking. And the first, I'd want to go over and say, hey, welcome. It's so nice of you to come. And, and you can see even famous people become childlike in the presence of other famous people. So he talks a lot about how celebrity, all these things are, are, are very seductive, money, fame, and power. We all want them. We, and he claims the reason we want them is so that people will pay attention to us, so that we'll feel important. And he says it's a bad way to feel important. It's a bad way to be loved because it will corrode and corrupt you. Nothing wrong with a little bit of money. He says, OK, but don't pursue it for its own sake. So he says the right way to be loved is to be wise and virtuous. And he spends a lot of time talking about what lovely, uh, it, it, to be lovely. So be lovely and you'll be loved by a smaller group. Not as noisy, he says, a quieter, smaller crowd, a, a less glittering path, but it's the one he, he recommends. And then he spends a lot of time on what loveliness is. And he talks about propriety and virtue. And I wanted to say a little bit about what Smith sees as propriety, because it's, it's so fascinating. Propriety for Smith, in our language, is, is to do the proper thing. But that has a certain stodgy sound to it. And what Smith really meant by proper, among other things, was the ability to match your emotions to people who are around you. And one of the most fascinating examples he gives is the contrast that we have between how we cope with success versus tragedy. So for success, he says, if you have a small success, you have a nice little, a little windfall, or you have something good happen to you at work, people will love to hear about it and join in and share it with you. He says, joy is a very nice emotion. But he says, if you have a big success, you're not going to be so happy if they're not close to you. And he says, the man who by some sudden revolution of fortune is lifted up all at once into a condition of life greatly above what he had formerly lived in, may be assured that the congratulations of his best friends are not all of them perfectly sincere. <laughs> Gore Vidal said it a little more bluntly, every time a friend succeeds, I die a little. <laughs> um, so big success, people really kind of don't want to hear about it. A little success, ah, that's nice, huh? oh, congrats, way to go. Now, but tragedy is reversed. Big tragedy, we're very empathetic. 
okay? You try to harmonize your emotions. Both sides do. So a horrible tragedy happens to person A. Person B tries to empathize but can't really fully empathize with the tragedy because it's not happening to them. Can't really literally feel their pain. Tries to, gets close, but can't match it. The person who suffered knows that the person can't match it. They try to dampen their emotional reaction so that there can be more harmony. So he says, when you go talk to a stranger about a tragedy, which you might, you'll be able to do it in an emotional way that isn't so devastating. But you do it with a friend and you might start sobbing, right? And he says, a stranger will help you take away the pain, which is a very unintuitive idea. He says, on the other hand, a small tragedy, what he calls a small vexation, he says, nobody cares about it and they don't want to uh, hear about it and they'll make fun of you, actually. They'll use it as a source of humor. And his advice is to then take your small vexations and instead of uh, whining about them, uh, make a joke out of them and you'll get more sympathy. He actually gives the example of, of somebody who, who's jilted by their mistress. He said, if you're jilted by your mistress, keep, make a joke out of it. And I thought, boy, times sure have changed. Uh, <laughs> not that many people tell me about their um, mistress jilted him over, by, over the weekend, uh, over uh, coffee. But uh, in his day, I guess that was a, a, a common misfortune. So he has a lot of subtle and interesting things to say about how to lead a good life, but he also has a lot to say about what creates a good society. And he argues that our innate desire to be loved and lovely, and in turn, respect others who are lovely, and disdain those who aren't, creates civilization. Now, I wrote this book partly to clear Smith's name, but also to remind economists and policymakers that often what really matters is what takes place between individuals and not in the grandest or most dramatic nations, uh, actions done at the national level. In the US, and I suspect here, there is some unease that our best days are behind us. And many people in the United States, at least, they yearn for these grand national projects like we used to have. Let's go to the moon again. Oh, we've been to the moon. Let's go to Mars, right? <laughs> the idea that we need to do something together at the, at the national level. And Smith warns against hubris on the part of leaders. He condemns people who, have, who are visionaries and who manipulate people against their will to create their own vision of the great society. And in that level, he's warning us about dictators. But he's also warning us about the unintended consequences of policies, even when they're well-intentioned, and the challenges of national policy to make sure that they enhance our opportunities to lead a good life. Now, you might be tempted to think that all of this talk about Smith and virtue has nothing to do with economics. But Smith teaches us that money isn't close to everything. And economics is not only about money, it's about how to get the most out of life. To get the most out of life, we have to understand the consequences of our choices, which is what economics is all about. It's about what we give up when we do one thing instead of another. It's about how our choices add up to create a market on the one hand or a culture of trust on the other. And economics is about how we spend our time, the ultimate non-renewable resource. We only have so much of it. We would be wise, I suggest, to spend that time wisely, and some of that time is best spent with Adam Smith. I'm fascinated by Smith's view of what we might call individualism, because, of course, Wealth of Nations is all about, in some ways, it's been taken to be an affirmation of individualism yes. by pursuing a self-interest. When Smith talks about how change happens in the world, he urges us to understand, to have a modest view of the way in which change happens in the world. It happens through memes. It happens through social trends which unfold over time. Cultural so, norms. Cultural norms. He has a kind of sociological view, really, Absolutely. of change, not an economist's view Correct. of change. So how do you think that Smith would, would, would respond to the modern notion of individualism? Well, Smith was an individualist in the sense that he thought the right way to think about how people behave is th as individuals. But as, as you say, he was fascinated and very aware of the role that cu cultural norms, memes, and other things play in our, in our evolution as, as a culture. Uh, for a long time, I lived with four small people who occasionally annoyed me and kept me from doing what I wanted to do. They are my children. And occasionally, I wanted to hit them. Well, I did want to hit them, but I never have. They're now 15 through 22, so I think I'm on a hot streak. Um, and the reason I didn't hit them is my wife and I sat down and we decided we're not going to strike our kids. If you had told me that when I was 12 years old, I would have thought, oh my gosh, of course I'm going to strike my kids. My dad hits me. <laughs> That's a good idea. That's what good parenting is, in fact, in many cultures still. It would be bad parenting not to hit your child. Now it's bad parenting to hit your child. How did that change? What happened? There was no memo, there's no law, there was no regulation. But somehow that cultural change uh, evolved. And that's what one of the things Smith is, is fascinated by, 
these processes that a contemporary of his, Adam Ferguson, said are the product of human action but not human design. Who decided that you shouldn't hit your kids anymore? Nobody. Well, we, but we did, because through this complicated thing. So how does Smith think about this? What's the economics of it versus the sociology? The way I think of it is, when I go buy an apple, I don't affect the price of apples. When I buy 100 apples, I don't affect the price of apples. If I come in every week and buy 100 apples, the price of apples doesn't go up. But if everybody every week decides to buy 100 more apples, the price is going to go up because it's going to be, create a shortage, which is going to in turn start to push the price up, which in turn will encourage people to grow more apples, et cetera. And we call that a market in economics. A market is this strange process where buyers and sellers jockey for position, buy and sell, and prices emerge from that. And I think Smith was saying the same thing happens with culture. He was saying that one person makes no difference. If I start using Google as a verb, I don't have any impact. But eventually, it's a verb. I can say I Googled that last night, and everybody nods and says, oh, yeah, of course. But the first person to said it was like, what? Do you, what? But that's how eventually things catch on. People stop hitting their kids, and people somehow start approving, and it emerges as the correct thing to do among a certain cultural set. And so I think it really is economics writ large. We don't think of that as economics, that marketplace of morality, that marketplace of culture. But it's similar in the sense that it's, it comes about through the interactions of lots of people in this non-obvious way. And that's really what Smith's writing about in both books.